Good morning. Great to be here today. I know several are out sick right now. It just can't seem to escape us. We'd like to pass it around, uh, but that's all right. Uh, again, it is great to be here. Good to have Tia and Shia and Addie Joe with us today. Good to see you all uh, visiting with us. Always thankful uh, every time that we have visitors with us here in Mount Vernon and, and anywhere it is that the Lord's body is gathered together. I, I recently saw a post from a preacher friend of mine where he and his wife had been gone on vacation. And, and uh, my friend, he's, he's about the same age as myself, and they were gone out of town, and, and they had scoped out where the local congregation was. So they had gotten up that morning, had got themselves ready. They showed up to services before Bible class. They were, uh, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes early or so. Well, they entered into the congregation, and, and they saw on the board there were, uh, on average, about 100, 115 members or so at this particular congregation. Well, as they got there, they had a few people who happened to kind of look at them. Maybe two or three smiled at them. They went down and they came towards the front and they sat down and sat through Bible class. Bible class ended, everything moved into worship and, and worship ended and, and they stuck around for a little bit and, and eventually found themselves leaving. Well, the entire time that they were visiting with this particular congregation... Only one person actually stopped to talk to them. Now again, my friend, he and his wife, they, they were okay. They're, they're well established in the faith, but obviously they had some concern. What if they had been new to the community? What if they had been looking for a, a place where they could worship and, and join themselves to the body of Christ? What if they had been a visitor from the community who maybe had never experienced what true worship looks like in the New Testament body of Christ Jesus? A lot of what ifs. Thankfully for us here in Mount Vernon, we are blessed with a loving and a friendly congregation. It's not uncommon when we have visitors that they might comment on how welcome they have felt or how friendly everybody is. And that's a wonderful thing, and we should be thankful for that. But when it comes to us stopping and thinking about the way it is that we, we treat our visitors, it's something that we need to regularly examine and, and think about not just the congregation as a whole, but even think about ourselves individually. Sometimes it might be that we have a mindset or we think, well, well I don't necessarily have to go speak to them because I know somebody else will. Or I know that we have greeters who are in the back, and that's what they do. They welcome as these visitors come in. But this is something collectively as the body that we all must examine and consider for ourselves. Because it is the case when we come to James chapter 2, we find something important as it relates to the way that we interact with our visitors. And in James chapter 2 and verse 8, in this context of, of dealing with visitors as they come into our assembly. James talks about something that he calls the royal law. The royal law that KC read for us a moment ago from Leviticus 19 and verse 18. James says in James 2 and verse 8 that the royal law is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And sometimes when we talk about loving your neighbor as yourself, we think about how that applies to, to those in the world and we think about it on a broad and in a general sense. But what James does is he brings it closer to home. Because James says every time a visitor enters into our assembly, that the royal law is being put to the test. Do we truly love our neighbor as ourself? And if we're going to pass the test, if we are going to follow the royal law, then according to James 2 verses 1 through 4, we are going to have to avoid partiality. But you see, being impartial can be a challenge. It can be a challenge because we naturally are drawn towards certain people. Certain personality types tend to click better than others. They, they jive together well. Certain interests are going to act like a magnet. And some people we just seem to always gravitate toward. And that is perfectly fine. But when it comes to making sure that we fulfill the royal law, that we are treating our visitors as we ought to, we have to make sure that we avoid partiality 
which means that we're going to have to evaluate our own personal bias. Look with me in James chapter 2, and let's read verse 1 together. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. James says we are not to hold the faith of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ with partiality. So we ask the question, how do we hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ? Who is it that we are willing to share the gospel of Christ Jesus with? Is it only with those with whom we think we may get along? Or instead, are we willing to truly share the gospel with anyone, no matter who they may be? Jesus tells us in Matthew 28 and verse 19 that we are to go, therefore, and make disciples of every nation. We're told in Mark 16 and verse 15 to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jesus tells us that the faith is something that is for everyone. That the gospel is to be taught and to be spread to all men. It is not something that we are to hold with partiality. An unfortunate reality in our world and even in, in fairly recent history is that there have been places, there have been congregations even of the Lord's church who have taken and established and planted a new congregation within the same community because there were some within the leadership who felt like this specific group of people was not going to fit in well with everybody else. Many times it had to do with race. Sometimes it had to do with the economic circumstances. It's an unfortunate reality, but if we look around, we can see at times, even in the world, how this type of bias plays out. James says when it comes to the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, there should be no bias. There should be no partiality. Because if we truly understand whose this faith is, that it is not our own, that the gospel is not our own, but it is our Lord Jesus Christ, when we see that He's our Master, that He is our Savior, that He is our Messiah who died for us all, then how can we not share His truth, share that faith with others? And so, yes, understanding the royal law and loving our neighbor as ourself, it means that I need to consider my own bias. Who am I willing to share the gospel with? But it goes beyond that. Because as James continues in verses 2 through 4 on this same point, James says, holding the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ also includes who I share myself with. Notice with me what James goes on to say, James chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, you sit here in a good place, and say to the poor man, you stand there or, or, or sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Now James, understand, is writing to a, a group of first century Christians. And James is writing to them about a real possibility if somebody were to, to come into their worship assembly. And he gives this comparison here, but, but think if James were writing this specifically to us today. What would he say? Might James say it is the case that it's Sunday morning and, and we're getting ready for Bible class, we're getting ready for worship? And over here on this side of the parking lot, a, a really nice vehicle pulls in. Oh, they get out of the vehicle, and, and it's a family, and this family, they're well-dressed. Everybody seems very well-behaved, and, and it just looks like they belong here. And so we all flock to them, and we, we welcome them, and we're, we're thankful that they're here, and we invite them to come down and to sit by us. But then on this side of the parking lot, oh, you hear the car coming in, and, and you can tell that it needs some work done to it. Oh, it may not look that great. And then out steps a, a family from, from this vehicle, and, and they're not dressed as well as these over here, but they're dressed in the best that they have. But we may not know that because 
we just cut a few glances their way and hope that they sit on the other side of the auditorium from us. We don't want them sitting on our pew. But we don't want them to be down near the front because the camera might pick them up and then what will others think if they happen to see that person in our assembly? If we treat them in that way, if we treat our visitors in the way that those here in James 2 treated the poor man that came into their assembly, we have to think about the message that it sends. What we are doing is telling these individuals that I do not want you here. But more than that, when you go back up to verse 1, and you see that this has to do with the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's not just saying, I don't want you here. But we're telling them that Jesus doesn't want you here. Is that the type of message that we want to send? James says if we are to fulfill the royal law, we must avoid partiality. We must evaluate our own bias and evaluate our own fellowship to see how it is that we are treating those who come into our midst. I came across this quote as I was uh, getting things together for this sermon, and I thought that it fit, fit well. It says, The doctrine of a congregation may be biblical, the singing inspirational, the sermon uplifting. But when a visitor finds nobody who cares whether he is there, he is not likely to come back. What a sad truth. A truth perhaps that we have experienced ourselves in traveling elsewhere. But we need to think about ourselves here in Mount Vernon. Are we doing the best that we can to fulfill the royal law, to make sure that we are avoiding partiality, and as James continues to make sure that we are evaluating things spiritually. As James is continuing this discussion here, James is, has obviously pointed out a worldly perspective. A worldly perspective is going to judge, is going to make decisions based on external appearances. That here again you have this man who seems well-to-do and, and may fit in great with everybody else. And, and then you have the man who doesn't really seem to belong and, and he doesn't really seem to belong anywhere. James says we can't look at things that way. Maybe we think about 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, when it is that, that it was time that we learn there's going to be a new king someday in Israel. And as, as it is that Samuel is going and he's, he's talking to Jesse about who it is that, uh, of his sons that's going to end up becoming king. Well, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, we find that God does not make his judgments based on external appearances, but he does so from the heart. And that's what we find James dealing with in these particular verses. If we look specifically in verse 5, we find how it is that, that our perspective needs to match God's perspective that we cannot continually think about things in the way that the world does. James says, Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? As he begins in verse 5 and he says, Listen, my beloved brethren. I can't help but think about the last time James told these brethren to listen. If you go back up into James 1, in verse 19, when he says, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. James is encouraging these brethren to put to practice what he told them to do in James 1 and verse 19. Don't get upset. Don't get up in arms, but stop and consider what James is saying. James says as he continues there in verse 5, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and, and heirs of the kingdom which He promised to those who love Him? But who had these brethren chosen? They had chosen the rich. They had chosen the one who God had not chosen because they were not looking at things from the proper perspective. But even as we consider who it is that God has chosen, it's easy, perhaps, for us to get caught up on how God has chosen the poor, but what does that mean for the wealthy? It doesn't exclude those who may have finances and may be well off. The important thing to note from verse 5 
is that God has chosen those who, as the end of the verse say, love him. Is it not the same truth we learn from Acts chapter 10? Acts chapter 10, when it is that, that Peter is taking the gospel to the Gentiles, he's taking it to the house of Cornelius. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, when Peter says, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, that God is no respecter of persons. But as it goes on in verse 35, Peter says, But in every nation, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. God loves those who love Him. God loves those who are obedient unto Him. And God has chosen those to be rich in faith, to be heirs of the kingdom, who will live righteously for Him. But who had the brethren chosen? Oh, as you keep looking there in what James says, and, and we go on into verses 6 and 7, we see they had chosen the one who, based on their motives, they thought would benefit them. It says in verse 6, But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? So my pages are sticking here. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you were called? What a humbling moment. To understand and to realize the one that God has chosen, the one who truly wants to do what is right and truly loves God, for James to turn around and say, you've dishonored that man. You've brought shame to that man by the way that you treated him. You told him you didn't want him here. You, you told him Jesus doesn't want you here. But that's the one that God has chosen. As he talks about how the rich would drag them into the courts and oppress them. In the first century, in the context, what we find culturally speaking is that the wealthy would often take advantage of the poor. They would treat them poorly and oppress them and they would even cheat them out of certain wages at times. In fact, you go to James chapter 5, you look in the, the first several verses of James chapter 5 and you can see exactly how this thing was taking place. But despite understanding how this was happening, and even though some within the congregation may have been treated that way, for some reason they still chose that wealthy man. They chose that man who James said blasphemed the noble name by which they were called. They chose the man who cared nothing about God, who cared nothing about Christianity. Because for some reason... They evidently believed that there was something that they could gain from that relationship. And we say, how could that happen? How could that have occurred? But does it not still happen at times today? You see, there are congregations and there are different times and situations in the world wherein those who may be more well off are, are more favored than those who may not have the means. You see, there may be some form of unrighteousness that's taking place. There may be some type of a sin that is being committed. And it may not go overlooked for the one who is poor, who is not well off. But for the one who has the finances, the one who, who keeps writing the checks, sometimes those things may go overlooked. What does James say is happening in these moments? What does James say needs to take place? James says if we are to follow the royal law, if we are to truly love our neighbor as ourself, then we need to learn to look at things spiritually. Don't consider how it is that we might benefit from having this family with us, how we might benefit for something else in the world because of this relationship or, or, or this association. But instead, think about it as God would. Are we favoring those who love God those who want to do what is right, who want to live the right way. How are we holding the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ? Are we doing so partially or impartially? Because if we are to truly follow the royal law, then what we find in James 2 verses 8 to 13, it means that we're going to have to live in mercy. 
And until it is, we can avoid partiality. Until it is, we can learn to truly look at things spiritually as as God would have us to. We are not going to be able to act mercifully as we ought to. In fact, when we look here in James chapter 2, we see from verses 8 and 9 that living in mercy means that we will love our neighbor. James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. James says that to love your neighbor as yourself is to fulfill the royal law. It's to fulfill what was spoken in Leviticus 19 and verse 18. But understand that this law here is royal because of the one who gave it to us. Our king has given this command. It is a royal law and it is a royal law that we as New Testament Christians, as kingdom citizens, are to follow. Now, yes, this is something that was given back in the Old Testament. But we still see, even here in James chapter 2, the need for us to live by this today. More than that, Jesus tells us that this is a necessity if we are going to someday inherit eternal life. If you would turn with me in your Bibles, let's turn to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. And it's in Luke chapter 10 that we find a a discussion that takes place between a certain lawyer and, and our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law, and what is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? He asks Jesus, What does it mean to truly fulfill the royal law? How do I love my neighbor? How do I know who is my neighbor? And as Jesus continues there in in Luke 10, verse 30, and, and continuing down through Verse 36, Jesus teaches a parable. A parable I'm sure that most all of us know, that that parable of the Good Samaritan, where this man is willing to extend mercy to someone who normally would not receive mercy. Somebody outside of his culture. Somebody outside of his religion. Someone who normally would have just not been given the time of day. Yet this Samaritan was willing to extend mercy, was willing to love his neighbor as himself. And so in Luke 10 and verse 37, the ultimate answer, who it is that was the neighbor, verse 37 says, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. And when we think about this parable of the Good Samaritan and we think about loving our neighbor, for good reason, we often again look outside of the congregation. But what happens when someone comes into our assembly? Think of James 2 in its proper context. When a visitor comes in, we have an opportunity to love our neighbor as ourselves. We have an opportunity to fulfill the royal law. And if we are not rightly fulfilling the royal law, then what we find in James chapter 2, and you look again at what James had to say in verse 9. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. If we're to follow the royal law, if we're to live in mercy, it means that we're going to carefully follow that law. It means that we're going to carefully consider God's Word and make sure that we are following it to the best of our ability. 
As James continues there, James chapter 2, look in verses 10 through 12. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Stop right there for a moment and think about what James is telling us. James says the same law that says do not commit adultery, do not murder, is the same law that says you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And James goes on and he's saying, well, you may not be an adulterer, but you may be a murderer. Well, the end result is the same. You still transgress the law. You still become a sinner. Do we realize what James is saying then about the way that we treat our visitors? About the way that we love our neighbor? It may not be the case that we're an adulterer. It may not be the case that we're a murderer. But what if it is we don't treat our visitors in the right way? What if it is we don't love our neighbor as ourself? Yes, the physical consequences may be different. But spiritually speaking, it will all be the same. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 tells us that our sin separates us from our God. Do not be mistaken. If we fail to show, or if we fail to fulfill the royal law, and if we are showing partiality, we are in sin. We must then, as James 2 and verse 12 says, so speak, and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Once again, this is not talking about following the old law in its entirety. Instead, this law of liberty that James speaks of here, James 2 and verse 12, is the perfect law of liberty that he spoke of in James 1.25. The perfect law of liberty which we see in that context is the word of God, the one that we are to follow. And when we are following God's word as we ought to, when we are avoiding partiality, when it is we are evaluating things spiritually, when it is at that point, we will truly be living in mercy because we'll be extending mercy. As James says in James 2 and verse 13, For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs. Over judgment. You think about that example that James used previously in the context. The rich man and, and the poor man. No matter where that poor man goes, it seems like society was always extending a hand, yes. But it was extending a hand to keep him away. To keep him at arm's length. Always trying to push him back. Always trying to keep him down. When that man came into the assembly, yes, a hand should have been extended, but not in the same way. The hand should have been extended to pick him up, to pull him closer, to bring that man into the family, because that's what holding the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ without partiality does. That's what evaluating things spiritually will do. That's what living in mercy means. That I am going to reach out to help this individual up. To provide for this individual what he cannot provide for himself. To provide for him not what I can give him, but what my Lord Jesus Christ can give him. Extending mercy means that I am going to be compassionate. I will give him a merciful hand to help bring him to the one true and saving mercy and grace of my God. Because when I extend that type of mercy, I'm acting just like my Father in heaven. When we look in Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and verse 36, a verse perhaps that we don't really consider all that often. But in Luke 6 and verse 36, Jesus says something important. He says, You be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. That just as God is merciful, we are to be merciful 
to others. Because what we find, James 2 and verse 13, that judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The way that I treat others, the way that I evaluate others makes a difference. It makes a difference on my eternity. And even as Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 2, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Following the royal law means that I will extend mercy. That I'm going to do my part to follow God's word, which means I will love my neighbor. Which means when a visitor comes into the assembly, I'm going to do my part to reach out to them, to welcome them, to love them. Because I know that I don't deserve this. I know the only reason this is possible for me is because God was willing to reach His his hand out toward me. That He was willing to give His only Son to die for me so that I might be a part of His body. The one body that Jared talked about the last couple of weeks now. Am I going to extend that same love, that same mercy to others? And as I mentioned when we began, we are blessed here in Mount Vernon that we are a friendly congregation, that we are a loving congregation. But we're not going to be judged on the day of judgment based on what the congregation did, but rather based on what we have done in this life. As you consider yourself this morning, How well are you following the royal law? How well are you loving your neighbor as yourself? I know for myself personally, I have room to grow. I have improvement to make. And perhaps you do as well. And this morning, if you realize that you need some help in that, don't try to improve that on your own. But reach out for help from from those who are here. Let us know so that we can pray for you, so that we can encourage and strengthen you. Or if it is the case that you have never obeyed the gospel of Christ Jesus, that you have yet to truly become a part of the body, but you realize the love that you have experienced from the Lord's body, and you want to be part of it, we can help you become a part today. Not anything that man will add you to, not anything that we will add you to, But when you learn the gospel of Christ Jesus and you obey it, Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 says the Lord will add you to his body. And if you want to learn more about that, let us know. And won't you come now as we stand and as we sing?